live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Science Cafe. I hope you're excited to be here tonight. Okay, just checking on you. Well, welcome everyone to the Museum of Natural Sciences. My name is Chris. Raise your hand if this is not your first Science Cafe. Fantastic. If somebody wasn't raising their hand, just like nudge them and let them know that you know they're here so that everybody feels welcome at the Science Cafe. Yeah, we are here every Thursday night at the Daily Planet Cafe discovering and exploring what's going on in the world of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, finding out how it applies to our daily life, and just sort of what's cool and curious, what's going on out there in the world around us. And right here, being situated in the triangle, we have a wealth of expertise that we can pull in. But sometimes it's worth it to look a little bit outside the triangle, too, for people who are really passionate about what they study, and tonight's speaker is somebody who's actually done three? This is third. This is the third Science Cafe, because the topics every time are incredible. Look at the stage. <laughs> I am surrounded by all kinds of cool stuff, and I don't even, this is a satellite, and no, these aren't satellites. <laughs> so tonight we're talking about solar cooking, the physics of solar cooking. Uh, with someone who the other two science cafes that she's done here at the museum also involved cooking in some way. The last time that Carla Ramsdale was here, she actually cooked pizza on the stage because she was talking about different types of pans and how they conduct heat, which one's better, and she'd actually studied all of this. And so you can go back and watch that one. If you go back through the museum's YouTube channel, you can probably find that one and learn the perfect pan for your kitchen if you wanted to do that. But the pizza was delicious too, by the way. I got to try some. As Carla is in the Department of Physics at Appalachian State University, and she's a mechanical engineer, so she knows her stuff when it comes to cooking and the physics behind it. So, welcome to the stage, Carla Ramsdale. Thank you. Super, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I always look forward to coming here. It's been the third time again. Um, has anybody been here any of the past times I've spoken? Super. Yeah, I love this environment. It's the most engaged audience that I speak to. I always leave here driving home and think of all the research questions that came up during our discussion. So I welcome those again. That's Perfect. Um, quick shout out, a thank you to the people that made this possible. I have continual support from my Department of Physics and Astronomy who have supported this work I do in energy efficient cooking. Um, also, the Office of Sustainability at Appalachian State, a bunch of rock stars that have really placed Appalachian on the map as the University of Sustainability, known nationwide, and I'm happy to be part of that team. Um, this, uh, some of the ovens you see here were made possible also by the Appalachian Energy Center and the Department of Sustainable Development development both on APPS campus as well. Okay, so if you were here for one of my past talks, I, the first talk was about the thermodynamics of water in the kitchen, and the second was about skillet material. Both things you could go home and sort of implement immediately, and I like to do that to try to make it something you can uh, adopt right away to reduce your food. Um, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. I am going in a completely <laughs> less applicable direction, this time talking about solar ovens. Just out of curiosity, does anybody here own a solar oven? Yeah, that's sort of what I was thinking. So you do, oh, super. So, um, so what I, I was inspired because this year was the total solar eclipse, which was just phenomenal. Um, did anybody make it into totality? Yeah, okay, it was like really amazing. I say the word totality now like eight months later and I still get chills. So the next one I put up there is April 8th of 2024. It comes pretty close, so put it on your calendar because it's, uh, it's really phenomenal. The next one will not hit the United States till 2045. So this is rare to have two so close. Uh, just be on the surface of the earth and at like two o'clock in the afternoon and it cools down and it gets, you know, dark and bats start flying around. It's really surreal and I 
would super encourage you to do it again. So since everything solar was cool this past year, I just decided to really kick into doing a lot more research and a lot more outreach events uh, based on solar cooking. And so you are getting uh, what has happened there. So it's not new for us to rely somehow on the sun to heat things for us, right? I mean, it's just very obvious. We've dried things in the sun. We've warmed in the sun for a long time. There's a story that Archimedes actually burned Roman ships trying to protect his homeland with a lens. Um, that is a story that is hotly contested. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's, it's very natural to try to want to cook with the sun. The problem is that in general, we can use a number like 1,000 watts per square meter. That's kind of the amount of power we're getting from the sun. And so um, if you think about your oven in your house, they range from about 1,000 watts to 5,000 watts. And so um, often the amount of sunlight that's hitting just the space of an oven isn't enough to get us up to baking temperatures. So the goal with solar cooking really is to try to funnel in a lot more solar energy. So really what we want to do is try to make a pretty small oven, right? A pretty manageable space that we can heat and then grab a bunch of solar energy from around and try to dump it into the solar oven. Um, and that's the goal. There's other things we do with solar energy. We use the sun to directly produce electricity with photovoltaic panels. So this is a tiny one. Obviously, we all have seen these before. Uh, this is not what we're talking about tonight. I love photovoltaics, no moving parts. The sun shines, you make electricity. It's uh, something we need to be doing a whole lot more of. But today we're going in a different direction, really talking about um, the thermal science of trying to, to wor work with the sun. So I just wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about some background physics so we can use some vocabulary here, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, the first is heat transfer. So I am a thermodynamicist. My background is in physics and then in mechanical engineering. And I worked in the power industry for a long time before coming into higher education. And I study the movement of heat and work and its effect on a system. The system I now study is food, which is really great. And so there's three ways to move thermal energy from a hotter body to a colder body. The first one is by conduction, and that's by the flow of thermal energy through a medium without the medium moving. So if you grab the handle of a pan and it starts to get hot, but the pan handle isn't moving itself, that's conduction. The second one is convection. And convection is the movement of thermal energy because the medium is moving, right? So if you start to boil water on a stove, you get these natural flows that happen in the pot. That's convection. And that's natural convection. You can also have forced convection, right, where you blow a fan and try to promote uh, further heating, like in a convection oven versus a regular oven. The third mode of heat transfer is radiation, and this one is really unique. Uh, we know a lot about radiation. It's, uh, it's the transmission of an electromagnetic wave, and uh, it's the only mode of heat transfer that doesn't require a medium. It doesn't need any stuff. Obviously, we feel the sun's warmth through the big open emptiness of space, right? And so this is something that makes radiation really unique. And so the goal of solar ovens is to manage those flows of thermal uh, thermal energy transfer, right? We want to try to, again, grab as much radiation as possible, but at the same time, we want to minimize our losses. So we want minimal conduction, convection, and radiation loss so that what we get, we can keep within the oven. And we'll talk about how each of these strategies does that in a different way. Um, if we want to talk about radiation for just a couple more minutes to understand what's happening, it's very similar to what's happening in our Earth system as well. It's the greenhouse effect. So what we know about radiation is that the energy of radiation is dependent on the body, the temperature of the body that emitted it. Okay, so you have the sun with an average surface temperature of 9,800 degrees. So the energy that it radiates clearly is incredibly energetic, makes it through the glass of a solar oven and through our greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, usually without any interference. Um, it then is incident upon either the oven or our earth and warms those surfaces. Then those surfaces, because they've become warmed, will emit their own radiation. But because they're at a significantly lower temperature, the energy of that radiation is much less, right? And so now that's stuff that we can start interfering with. Greenhouse gases can grab that lower energetic re-emitted and then throw it back out, sometimes back down to Earth to warm it again. 
In the same way in the oven, this lower energy radiation tries to make it out and now the glass can actually be a barrier so that then it'll stay and keep being recirculated within the oven and that's what causes us to be able to get ovens to 500 degrees just based on solar energy. The other last concept we need to talk about as far as physics goes is the law of reflection. This is in the subfield of optics. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. So if you take a flat reflective surface like a mirror and you measure, you uh, look at the perpendicular to that mirror and you have some kind of incoming radiation. If you measure the angle of that radiation to the perpendicular, we know that the reflected ray will be that same angle on the other side of the perpendicular. So basically we say the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Okay, and that then we can sort of predict what's going to happen on a bounce, so we can direct that in some way to do something good for us. And that's true whether the mirror is flat or if the mirror is curved, and it's also true if the mirror is um, not hitting in the, in the middle. If it's a curved surface, we just want to look at the tangent to the curve at the place where the solar energy is hitting and grab the perpendicular to that tangent, and then we have the same angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Okay, so there's broadly three categories of solar ovens we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to breeze through them fairly rapidly because I can't go into details with all of these. But they're up here and I hope that you'll take the time after the talk to come up and test them out and touch and feel. They're really, is, uh, it's really just phenomenal. We're going to start with the easiest one. So we have what's called a box oven. Um, and then we also have evacuated tube ovens. These over here are all sort of in that. And those categories, the box ovens and the evacuated tubes, all replace your oven. There's also these uh, dish reflector cookers, right? So these over here would fit in this other category. And rather than replacing your oven, these uh, replace your stovetop, right? So they're just, rather than having uh, an electric resistance burner or some kind of flame, you try to um, focus the sun instead. So let's start with the most basic one, which is a box oven. There's many different manufacturers. This is Sun Oven, which is probably the most popular of the box ovens. So uh, we see pretty simply we have an internal and an external. Internal's anodized aluminum box, black, so it's a good solar absorber. Uh, the outside is plastic, and there's an enormous amount of insulation between the two. So that's how we're trying to manage that loss of conduction and convection is that we pack this box with a ton of insulation. So when we get it hot in there, it kind of stays warm. I've had this oven out for hours, for an entire day's worth of cooking, and the outside is always cool to the touch, right? So this is a really good insulator. And then here is uh, the inside cavity. And so uh, there's a tray in there actually that rotates. And so as you uh, tilt it to try to keep up with the sun, your food stays flat so you don't slosh things around, which is a nice idea. And then we want to try to funnel in as much solar radiation as possible. And so here are the mirrors that are typically used. And if you uh, think about that law of reflection again, if I have an incoming beam and I measure the angle from the perpendicular, the reflected angle is going to be that same angle on the other side of the perpendicular. And so we have a way of sort of funneling all this thermal energy into the box itself. As with any solar oven, we are going around the sun. So the sun's position in the sky changes all day long. And so about every 20 minutes, it's a good idea to go out and make sure that things are um, properly focused. Uh, that is done both in elevation and in azimuth, right? So the sun changes its elevation both throughout the year and throughout the day, and then it also rises in the east and sets in the west. So um, this oven is pretty easy to focus. You just make sure it's casting a symmetrical shadow behind it, and then you also have to make sure that the, the shadow of this front edge is directly below it. And there's a foot uh, that's sort of uh, in the back here that you can pull out and snap into place to try to get the tilt of the oven uh, correct. So it's a great oven. Pretty clear advantage uh, for this oven is that it's a nice big space, right? I can bake a cake in there. I can do a loaf of bread. I could even do a Thanksgiving turkey. So that's uh, one of the huge advantages. Not terribly resilient to cloud cover, though. So you really need a pretty abundantly sunny day for this technology. Um, this is another box oven here. Uh, nice concept because it actually comes with a plug. So it's just supplemental heating. 
I cannot tell you how many times I've been cooking something and then the clouds roll in and you just, you're out of luck at that point. So to be able to plug in and turn on and just get the rest of the cooking accomplished or maybe get a couple more degrees out of things is, is lovely. Um, so great concept. The design of this uh, leaves a little to be desired. So because when you go to check your soup, there's a, <laughs> a little bit of a tipping problem. So, so I mean, with all these ovens, there's so many things to try to plan uh, to make sure you get things right. But this is a, it's a great idea to have the optional um, electric resistance burner in there as well. So that pretty much wraps up the, the box ovens. And we've talked about their advantages. They're both a pretty good volume. But the disadvantage is that uh, you need pretty abundant sunshine. So we're going to go on to our next oven now, which is an evacuated tube oven. Let's put this out so I have some space here. Now, evacuated tubes were first designed in the 1980s, predominantly to bring domestic hot water heating so that you can get rid of or at least help um, your hot water heater for your domestic hot water need. And the story goes that the developer of this oven, the Go Sun, was uh, installing some of these panels and had a hot dog to eat for lunch and thought, hmm, I wonder if, and stuck the hot dog in here, heated in, you know, very rapidly, and there was the birth of the idea to try to use these evacuated tubes uh, as solar ovens. Let's get this here. Um, so we're going to have to talk about the law of reflection for another minute here because these were fairly straightforward. We were trying to focus onto an area and so a flat plate was doing the job well. Uh, in an evacuated tube, what we're trying to do is now focus along this line. So the reflection becomes a little more tricky. Um, we're going to have to use some kind of a curved surface. And intuitively, we may want to say that a semicircle is maybe the best shape for that because it's probably going to reflect onto, a, onto one point. And so if we look at circles here, we have incoming radiation, and we see that those get reflected onto our oven. That's fabulous. But as you move closer into the middle, we see the next set of rays will actually be focused along a line that comes out from the center of curvature of a semicircle. And if we go further, we're either going to have um, more problems. So I've greatly exaggerated the width of the focal point here for this presentation. But the point is that if you're using a circular mirror, your focal point will not all hit the oven. Some of it's going to miss it. And this is really critical that we're funneling in solar energy. So what we do instead is choose a parabola. And if y'all don't remember that from our days of geometry, I threw an image up here too as to what a parabola is, the slice through a cone. But if we look then at what happens to this incoming radiation off a parabola, we see that it all does uh, focus onto one central point. And so that's the shape we're really trying to go for whenever we have these curved mirrors. Uh, the other important thing with these ovens, again, is that we make sure we focus them and move them throughout the day. So this will tilt toward the sun this way, and then also you want to just make sure you're keeping up with it. We see that if we're off focus um, on a parabola, we also will be off focus, and so we might be at a, at a focal point that's missing the oven completely also. So this is actually a pretty nice design because these are compound parabolas, and so this even can accommodate some off focus light and still do a pretty good job. Okay, so what's an evacuated tube all about? Well, it's funny you ask, because last week I was doing a talk like this at uh, Appalachian State, and unfortunately one of my evacuated tubes met its death. <laughs> but then I thought, oh, it's kind of nice, actually, because now I have a nice uh, demonstration piece for what an evacuated tube looks like. So here was the tray, and this was an this was evacuated tube, right? Okay, so an evacuated tube is a genius at that management of thermal energy, right? So we take two concentric cylinders and we evacuate the space between them. We suck out all the air, right? And remember those first two modes of heat transfer required a medium, right? Conduction and convection. Well, if I don't have a medium, then I'm not going to lose anything by those. And so that's really one of the things that makes these so efficient is that whatever you grab by radiation, you're not going to lose by conduction and convection. Um, we also take borosilic glass is what we use, and uh, that's sort of what most Pyrex is made out of. It's very strong. It also has very high transmissivity, so it doesn't really block any of the incoming radiation. 
And lastly, it has a really low thermal expansion coefficient. So as it heats up to these crazy high temperatures, 600 degrees sometimes, you don't pop them because they, uh, they're able to accommodate that with pretty low thermal expansion. So we take the inside glass and we coat it with copper to evenly conduct the thermal energy that we're gaining. And then also uh, we put a coating on the outside, also a titanium oxide that is uh, good at absorbing thermal energy. And then it limits the re-emission. So that's one of the ways we try to block the radiant loss. We don't want to put a reflective surface on here because the incoming radiation is going to come through. It doesn't care if it's evacuated between the two. It doesn't need a medium. It's going to hit this surface and just be reflected back out. Right? We want to absorb it, warm this inner tube, let that copper distribute that evenly, and then radiate that thermal energy to the inside of the oven. That's the whole goal. These stoves are unbelievably efficient. Um, I've done a lot of outreach events. I, at one point, had a really, you know, rainy day, so I didn't even take the ovens out. I kept them under a stove. I had this thing an, uh, under a stove, under a tent. And um, when I was cleaning up hours later, I recognized that this tray was warm. It had been under a red tent the whole day. It was 200 degrees under a tent on a rainy day. So they're unbelievably efficient. Um, we see a pretty clear limitation here. Right, so no Thanksgiving turkeys in, and if, <laughs> what's that? Hot dogs. Hot dogs are great, you can get super creative. There's an enormous Facebook group that's uh, coming up with like muffins all the way down, bread sticks, chicken fingers. I mean, you, you can do a lot, but clearly you're not gonna make um, anything large. So that's one of the drawbacks here, but um, they're incredibly efficient. I was doing an Earth Day event, cooking with these on Friday. And I had these fabulous students out there helping me. And they made an entire batch of cookies in like no time flat, because these are really quick. Not one of them burnt. And then they had to go to class. So if only they had their priorities straight and stayed with me instead of going to class. Then of course I burnt. The next batch was I mean, unbelievably burnt like, because down here it just gets so fast hot and I got distracted talking. And uh, so I was like, oh, the last batch and I messed it up. Um, so not all evacuated tubes are created equal. There's uh, this and this one right here actually is the exact same diameter tube. I was really attracted to this because I like the protective case. It's nice, easy to transport. Um, and I haven't done enough research on this. I can tell you I can make three or four batches of cookies in that one to the one in here. It's either the evacuation isn't as good, the coating's not as great. I believe the reflectors probably have something to do with it. So it's something to take into account that there's a lot of factors that have to come together to really make these things uh, work as beautifully as they do. The other thing that's great is, uh, so the same company that made that one decided to try to address this problem about uh, limited cooking space. And so this is the larger sort of cousin of that one. Getting a little too busy up here. Yeah, so this is much bigger. We have a really nice way to focus solar energy. We see now we have you know much bigger space. We can actually do a loaf of bread, steam some vegetables. Um, the drawback here is that obviously it's more expensive and also the, the heat up time is significantly more because you have much greater volume to surface area and so it'll get there, it'll get as hot, but it just takes quite a bit more time. Okay. Yeah, so I decided to just chart real uh, quickly one day, like how long have the comparison between the box oven and this evacuated tube. So if you see the red line there is this box oven right here. It maxes out this time of year at about 330 degrees, takes about 30 minutes to get there. Uh, this got up to 450 degrees. It gets to 350 in 15 minutes or so. It's just incredibly fast. Uh, this also will get up to the four or 500s, but it takes significantly longer. And so I threw a sort of preliminary curve of that up there too. So if you have the time to preheat, you have ample space in here. This is um, a fabulous uh, way to go. Okay, so the last one we're going to talk about are these reflectors. Now, these are really different now because all of these things were ovens, and so we had to be really mindful about our losses of conduction and convection. Now, this is uh, just a stovetop, so we no longer worry so much about that management. We're just trying to scoop up as much solar uh, as possible. 
We again have to be conscientious that it's a parabola rather than a semicircle so that we're focusing on to one central point. I have two here. <laughs> this is my favorite. So let me move some of this stuff off the table here. A solar espresso maker was the big hit of this um, Earth Day event I attended last week. I can make a, a cup of espresso in 15 minutes and just keeps rocking uh, with this guy right here. So yeah, this is a little mocha pot that's right on the focal point. I can burn a piece of paper in this focal point in about 10 seconds. Uh, but so you just fill the bottom with water, put the little grinds in, screw it on, and it really in about 15 minutes, it'll uh, convert to steam and percolate up through to there. So this is a big hit. We got to also make sure that we're focused properly. And so this thing can tilt and also can tilt this way to make sure it's keeping up with the sun. And then here is a larger version of that. This is brand new to me. I have cooked on it once, so I don't have any data yet. Um, but obviously, you put a skillet there, and you can kind of cook. Uh, you cook from behind, and so it's supposed to replace a range. <clears throat> the day we used it, we only got the surface temperature of the pan up to about 300 degrees, which is fine. But if I'm trying to really sear something, I want more like 450. <clears throat> it was a super windy day. So I think the convective losses were really fighting me. So we're having radiation gain and convective loss at the same time. I'm dying to try it on a sunny day. This week has not been helpful. <laughs> I, mean, I was really going to have cookies for you guys. The last two times I was here, I cooked on stage. I can't cook on stage when I'm talking about solar ovens. And I was going to have a tray of cookies, but... Boone has not been accommodating to such things. So that's fabulous. There's a much larger version of this sole source also that I know works phenomenally well, um, but it's not transportable. So it's the first time they made this transportable. It fits in a backpack. It's really lightweight. Um, it's pretty great. And then the last one is somewhere a hybrid between an oven, but mainly a reflector. These are you know, the lowest efficient, clearly not a very uh, good management system of our <coughs> conduction and convection losses, but we have uh, the surface that reflects all that radiation onto this tray. I've boiled pasta in here. I've boiled probably is an aggressive term, but I've gotten pasta water up to the point where it cooked. Um, I've melted quesadillas. It makes s'mores all day long, right? It's enough to melt chocolate and marshmallows makes a very happy um, elementary school outreach project. And it comes in two different sizes. There's uh, that large one, and then it's little baby backpacking counterpart. So pretty, pretty fun. So <clears throat> what an excellent question. I have not taken data on that. I have data on this one, but not on that one. So um, I, my gut is that they're about the same. I've cooked together with them a long time ago. I can't remember right off the top of my head, but see, that was my, my first research question right there. So funny story, the, the torch for the 2010 Olympics was lit by a parabolic dish similar to this. It was supposed to like be capturing the fire of the gods for the uh, Olympic torch lighting. I thought that was kind of cool. I might try that. Um, so just in closing, if we try to think about the application of all this fabulous technology. If anybody's interested in getting into this world, I would never talk you out of it, right? It's, it's very fun. But if we think about it in the developed world, it's probably more um, a hobby, and it's also fabulous for things like emergency preparedness, right? But I don't think it's going to really move the needle on our energy consumption of our kitchen. I think there's some really easy things we can do with the right food choices and other things that we can adapt really rapidly in our kitchen. Um, but where I really see amazing opportunities for solar cooking is in developing countries, in refugee camps, in places where the resources are so limited and people are having to make a decision between buying food or buying fuel to cook that food. And very often these are environments that are really rich in solar radiation um, access. And so to be able to uh, sort of have the ability to have free fuel, you don't have to spend half your day trying to deforest to get wood to burn and what have you seems like just such a natural uh, step. Most of the solar oven companies up here are actively involved in that kind of work and often when you purchase an oven, part of the work goes to trying to deploy these wider. But I see enormous opportunities for water purification and for cooking in those kind of environments. Uh, recent research that I read actually showed that these kind of of reflectors where you're really maybe replacing a three stone fire with something that's very similar cooking, right? So to try to 
adopt maybe an evacuated tube in that environment would take a little more learning, a little more cultural shift. Whereas this, you could really hypothetically use the same pot and the same um, technologies that you're using and, and replace it. So it's interesting to try to think forward as to where this technology is leading and, and what opportunities lie ahead. So I appreciate your time. I hope we have answered some questions and piqued your interest because it's super fun. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Let's give her a round of applause. All right. So if you've got questions, I think most of you know how it works from here on. Raise your hand, let me know. I'll bring a microphone to you. Katie will also have a mic, so we'll be running around uh, so that we can get all of your questions about solar cooking and physics. So I had a, is this on? Yeah. I had a question. Uh, um, I guess it's about the concept of reflection. Yeah. And uh, when I look at all the metals you have, they wouldn't satisfy me very much if they were a mirror. Yes. So I realize a mirror is maybe impractical because it's including glass and then this metal that then reflects your image. But I guess my question was, would you have to consider something else if you actually could make these shapes out of glass ah, mirrors? Because we see the nice reflection of ourselves. But Absolutely, we yeah. So we're going to lose energy on any of the bounces, right? And so you're right. We're losing enormous energy with some of these because they're they're not the perfect reflective surface. I think weight is one of the biggest concerns why we're not using actual mirrors and also obviously f they'll, they'd be a lot more fragile. So it's funny you ask that question because uh, one of the research projects I'm taking on next year is to try to see if we can do something with a Fresnel lens. So this is a Fresnel lens that's a line focus. I don't know if you can tell that, but it's focused on a line rather than a point. There are people solar cooking with point focus Fresnel lenses. You can take the screen off of old televisions and they're the Fresnel lens and they focus Focus onto a point. You can watch YouTube videos all day long. They get a cast iron skillet crazy hot. They are dangerous because you're cooking under the focal point, so you can't get your hand in the way. This is much more comfortable to me because the radiation is coming from below. I can't get in the way of it unless I reach underneath there, which has happened. But um, but this way you have to be much more careful. But I'm curious if I can take this on an evacuated tube, for example, right, and put this about the same uh, catch area and see what this does. So I have no idea but I have found the student <laughs> and so we'll be doing this starting in the fall to try to see what the comparison is and an excellent question you know what else can we do about these reflectors to make them make them better yeah well y you uh, partially answered one of the questions I had in the back of my mind which was uh, about Fresnel lenses um, yeah because the uh, the energy is proportional to the square footage right um, but a, a more practical question, how long do these um, devices last, the ones that you've talked about in practice when you're talking about corrosion or or dirt build up, which yeah. would negatively impact their, their efficiency? Well, so that's an excellent question. I don't know the answer. I know the oldest oven I have is a Sun oven. I've probably had it for 10 years. I don't have it out all the time. I've done a lot of outreach and research with it. It's it's fine, but it's fine. I don't get that oven as hot as I used to. So it maxed out about 3.30. It is April, not summer, so I'm probably going to squeak a little more out of it there, but I think you have degradation of the seal to the glass. you got to make sure the glass is always really clean, but if you're conscientious about your reflectors especially and most of these things have like that has separate bags for each of those uh, reflectors to go into so you're not scratching them whenever you damage this the surface that's when you're going to start seeing degradation so I don't have a number I imagine they're pretty resilient if you don't break them you know one of the concerns of, of these is there's really not much to degrade here right they even come with a scrub brush in the middle so you can really get the inside nice and clean if you've gotten fat splattered on it. Uh, one of the biggest concerns is if you preheat it and then, you know, try to fill it with liquid. That's, that's a t not a good idea at all, you know. So um, you can pop these really quick, even though they're, they have low thermal expansion ratios. If you get up to 500 degrees and you put 60 degree water in it, it's going to pop, you know. So there's those kind of concerns also mm -hmm. as far as longevity. And a lot of these companies offer replacement tubes if that's a problem. I've never had a problem unless, of course, you drop it on the ground. <laughs> that, that error was not because of cooking. It was really, it just met its demise. So what about the cost? Are these cost effective in developing countries? Oh, excellent question. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're not cheap. 
<laughs> so you can start with uh, a thing. I don't know cost, to be honest, off the top of my head. Uh, you know, really, really expensive, probably not cost effective. These evacuated tubes, you know, 200-ish, maybe right on in the middle 200s, I feel like. I'm, I'm half guessing 200 about dollars. Um, that goes up to over $500. These are like $350. So, you know, it's hard to deploy. I do think that part of the cost that we're paying, though, is the deployment of these in third world countries. So I don't know what the actual cost is if we were really trying to do a third world. I would love to see material costs really drop. We're seeing that in evacuated tubes because they're becoming so popular for domestic hot water. There's a lot more manufacturers on the market, and so these are starting to, actually the one that broke was like a pack of two for $100 or something. So, you know, it's starting to get to where, again, they're not all created equal, but um, there's a lot of DIYs too. This, this is one I didn't even grab, but there's, I think this tube is actually sub $100, maybe $70. It's got a nice volume to it. It just doesn't come with a reflector. So you'd have to try to come up with some kind of parabolic thing to go around it. I'd love to. I had a student actually that did that, but then he graduated and he took it with him. Because <laughs> he, he did it on his own. It wasn't a university project, but he was pretty jazzed about it. And he'd go do stuff at my events, but or uh, events on campus. But yeah, there, so there's lots of opportunity. And I do think the price, especially evacuated tubes, are going to be dropping as the technology becomes more common for domestic hot water. I saw a hand go up earlier. Who had, oh, it's right here. So for those of us who live in the Western world and think of these as camping stoves, yes. I guess part of the charm is that you know you tinker with it while you're cooking your hot dog. Yeah. But I can sort of imagine in um, developing countries, it w these could be a lot more efficient and a lot more useful to people if there could be some kind of a mechanism like a nest for solar stoves so that there was some way to sort of keep tabs on it um, digitally and, and yeah. keep it aligned with the sun and yeah. so somebody didn't have to stand there all the time Absolutely. and be moving it. Is anything like that on the horizon? Yeah, so here's my funny story with that. I had, um, I had a student last year that I worked with that we were doing solar water per pasteurization and we, you know, we're a bunch of geeks and so we're in the lab and we got this astronomer involved and we're talking about heliostats and PV panels to actuate these valves that would open because our goal was to try to have a big batch of nasty, dirty, not drinkable water and then people could leave for the day and have this thing go and this, this thermostat would actuate a valve to dump into a clean bucket so you'd know everything in the clean bucket had reached a safe temperature. So I mean that was just <laughs> incredible complexity when you put a bunch of physicists on this project. And so we met with Wine to Water which is one of our local nonprofits that does a lot of water work in the third world and the first rule they told me was okay first of all nothing can be shiny <laughs> and I was like Ugh, this is a serious problem so yeah I mean there's, there's definitely we know the technology to be able to helio track and and all that, but to try to actually deploy that, make it affordable, you know, is still, I think, I don't know that there's, there are, there are enormous reflectors, for example. There's enormous box ovens. They're like tractor trailer, not tractor trailer, but a trailer size that you could do loaves of bread at a time. I still don't think they, they track the sun. I think that still has to be done manually, but yeah, I mean, that, that was our dream, was to have something you could just let happen and it got price prohibitive. It's still an active research project. Well, that's part of what this, this lens thing is kind of answering is how can we remove some of the shininess, <laughs> make it something that's non-destructible and yeah. Hold on a second. Shiny? Sorry. Can you uh, explain just, that nothing can be shiny? But I think their point was that in a lot of these communities, shiny stuff is so rare that if you had something shiny, it wouldn't last there, especially if you walked away from it, that somebody would be super attracted to it and there'd be people would steal, you know. Might have more value. It would have much another more value as a mirror in somebody's house than it would as a solar oven, basically, I think is the bottom line. So it, uh, you know, it was funny. It's, they have great, they're doing things so simple too, right? They have these fabulous water filters that are, that work fabulous and are pretty low budget and not very fragile. And so it seemed at one point like we were just trying to reinvent a solution that there seemed to already be a pretty good solution for. Not all of the microwave things are metal. Are the ones that are metal work easier? What a good question. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent question. This thing, what do you think is more efficient between that and this? Metal. 
Yeah, absolutely, because it's a better, better reflector. Look at all the strange surface on this thing, right? So if you have solar radiation coming in, it's not all going to bounce the same way. Some of it's going to go thrown this way and that way and all every which way. It's an excellent question. Yeah, that's what, if we could get it to be glass, we could even get it smoother and make it even a better reflector. So a budding scientist right here in the front row. <laughs> Come to App State in about however many years that is for you. <laughs> we can work together. It'd be fun. So other than the s'mores, what's your favorite part of your job? Oh, <laughs> I mean, I love working with students. It's my favorite part of the job, really. But um, yeah, I mean, I just feel really lucky. I, I teach general education courses for the most part, so I love to try to make physics not so, not so intimidating, because for whatever reason, my science has a pretty bad <laughs> stigma. So yeah, I teach gen ed. I teach the physics of energy and sustainability. I teach a whole class on energy efficient cooking. And so I, I just love working with the students and seeing that and that trying to inspire that. So I have a question. Yeah. All of these look like they're commercially available. They Is are. that true? I mean, who's buying these and why are they buying them? Oh, I mean, there's an enormous population. Yeah, I mean, go to Facebook, YouTube, whatever. There's a lot, a lot of emergency preparedness. So think of what happened in Puerto Rico, Houston, Florida this past summer to have an evacuated tube, you know, to be able to get you through some of those for water purification as well as cooking is, you know, just a great thing. So a lot of um, emergency preparedness. And it's just fun. I mean, so 4th of July, you show up with one of those things to a picnic when everyone else is like hovering over <coughs> this smoky fireplace. You're like, I got my, I got my evacuation stick, some hot dogs. 10 minutes later, they're brown, just as like crusty and beautiful as they're going to come off the grill. So, I mean, there it's fun. It's, it's great fun. Yeah. So there's, there's a big market for them for sure. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Quick question, is anyone designing a modular system where the oven itself is stationary and a lens is what you're moving every 20 minutes? Oh, haven't seen it. It seems like you could have a more fixture style oven. Sure, yeah. And then move the... Yeah, 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 no, I love that. So the larger one of this is it's really quite a bit bigger and it's not meant to be transportable. So it's kind of meant to stay in place. And you know, like this one, you're gonna tilt this and you're gonna swivel it with the sun. And so it's not really a lens that's moving, but in that case, there's like a, there's actually a black cover that comes with that one. So you put the cover, the intention is that you just leave it out all the time. When you're ready, you pull the top off, you get it focused right. And then you're just, the fixture, the feet, the place where the pan is never moves. You just move the reflector around it, so. But I've never seen an automated system to that to do that. It's a good question. Another research project. So, has there been any other glass shape besides that evacuated tube that has been successful, like a bubble? Yeah, I have no idea. It's an excellent question. I a sphere, right? Yeah, I mean, one thing. Oh, so interesting. So one thing that's unfortunate about a box oven is that the door is on the top. So when you, I mean, you're going to have to open it to stir, to add, to check, whatever, and heat rises or actually cold air sinks. And so when you open the door, you get this huge glug of all the thermal energy you tried to build. Usually you get a drop of like 100 degrees and it takes about 15 minutes for it to recover again. So it's one of the great things about uh, the tube is that you're always kind of pulling out the side. You actually, in these tubes, uh, you have to be careful. This gets really much hotter than out here because you have convective losses that kind of work their way in here and not here. So I've been checking cookies before and you just keep sliding out. No, they're not quite done yet. And then you pull it all the way out and the ones inside were completely burnt. So if you can imagine now uh, a sphere that you could get to from the side, you wouldn't have the problem of this big poof of hot air coming out and you'd have a better volume to be able to put like a turkey in or something. So yeah. I love it. I don't know how to make it, but I'll be thinking. <laughs> About how big is the biggest solar oven that you saw? That I have seen? Have I ever seen one? Yeah, I think these are all the ovens I've ever seen. So probably evacuated tube would definitely be this Go Sun grill, which is really, really fun to work with. And then as far as the other ovens would go, these two are pretty similar. It's a little bit bigger size, but I never cook in that. So probably this one. But it's great. You can, like anything you can put in your oven, you could put in there too. You could brownies, you can cook chicken, you can just go to town. So I love that big loaf of bread. It's real fun. The one drawback of the this, it's not really a drawback, it's just an adaptation, is that you, there's, a there's a seal 
right between the glass and the oven because again you don't want to have these convective losses but because of that you don't have moisture loss either and so you kind of have to adapt to that so if you're cooking like stew you're gonna not lose as much moisture as you think you're going to you can cloud the glass and so there's you have to learn how to kind of work around that too uh, it's not as much of a problem the evacuated tubes because they do leak out some steam they're not perfectly sealed I didn't even show this where's this thing yeah this is this is fun too this is a solar kettle so this is just two cups of water, put it in the sun for, I don't know, 20 minutes, and you can boil water. And then when you're done, you actually can just seal it up and take it with you. And because it's that evacuated tube, once you get it hot in there, you're not going to lose it. It's really resilient. It can stay hot for a really long time. So it's great for pour over coffee when you're camping or something along those lines. It's, what's that? Yeah, it's a self-heating thermos. Exactly. Yeah, great camping. Or, or you know, it could pasteurize. It could uh, kill pathogens as well. You could get it to a safe temperature. So I'm curious how you regulate temperature. For certain types of cooking, don't you want to keep it at a consistent temperature? Yeah. It's a great game. <laughs> I mean, as a geek, I have like three thermometers in these things typically. But you just kind of start to learn. A lot of them have, like this has a thermometer on the edge of it here that you can kind of keep an eye on what's happening on the inside. It's not a perfect science. Uh, these have thermometers in them. The sun, uh, the, the sun oven does as well. but. Um, yeah, it's an art. You can also get, for the sun oven, you can actually get a dehydration package. So it comes with several trays, and I believe a photo, like a PV, a photovoltaic fan, to be able to run. So in that case, you want convective loss, because you want to dehydrate. <clears throat> and there's a thermometer on there, too. So in that case, you want it much colder, like 200 degrees. And so you purposely focus it out of the sun some to try to manage this temperature thing. And yeah, it's nothing like bake 350 start. <laughs> Like, that's so great. Like, oh, it's going to be 350 degrees. These are always kind of like, oh, there's clouds, and you got to get a focus. But it's fun. It's just, it really is. It's fun to do. Um, just wondered if you have to wear sunglasses. Yeah, really good question. Not with any of these, but these two, absolutely. Yeah, we, I require that people have sunglasses. Um, you're supposed to cook behind them. So it's not a problem, but you know, supposed to do and actually do <laughs> are not always right. The focal point is low, so you'd have to like get your head right down in here. But uh, we just we do this. You know, I don't know that it's damaging, but it just feels more comfortable. So I always require sunglasses on people when they're. And along with that, maybe um, it makes me think of. So Frank Geary, the famous architect, uh, did this uh, interesting uh, symphony hall in Los Angeles. I think it's the Disney money that's behind it. And after he finished it, if anybody knows his work, it's really a lot like these. There are yeah. lots of panels that have reflective surfaces. And he finished, and oh. quite a distance away, somebody had an apartment whose all the light was going right in and basically like sizzling the ant. Oh. And, uh, and so they filed this lawsuit and <laughs> had to have that panel changed. But I was just wondering if you have to worry about reflection other directions while you're cooking. Yeah, well, thankfully, the focal point is tight enough where it doesn't typically make it out. So, I mean, the focal point on this is on the back side of the, you can see, you can t take this out and put a piece of paper in here, and you can come and see it come into a point very quickly, and that's where it burns a piece of paper in about 10 seconds. Um, so, you know, out here, while you might catch some stray rays that are annoying, I don't think really any damage happens unless you're within the circle, and that's, you'd have to really be trying to... <laughs> I wouldn't. So where are all these being developed? Is most of this work being done in the U.S. or in Good Europe, cool. or where is it happening? I don't know the answer to that. The, this is, I know, U.S., and I know that the um, GoSan is a U.S. company as well. Patrick Sherwin's a developer there, so this is all U.S. I'm not sure about a lot of these other ones. It's, it's like, you're getting <laughs> you don't think the market's really strong there? Kind of like Seattle, maybe not one of those things that's a real, <laughs> yeah. So I've got a question. Yes. You're a mechanical engineer. Yes. Would you or how would you improve on any of these designs? Well, that's what I'm trying to do. We're trying to use some lenses. Um, I would love, like what we said, I, I want to deploy them in other countries where this is going to be really hard to manufacture. You know, so how can we think through ways? Uh, you know, something like this is probably easier to try to to be able to send the plans out and have other places be able to, to manufacture them. So, I mean, as far as efficiency, you get better reflectors, you get more reflectors per box area, you get higher surface area to volume. Um, the lenses, I'm really anxious to see how that helps, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there's always this balance between cost and, and fragile and, and then efficiency, but 
there's always ideas and I'm getting about 100 and it's like five years worth of research just from coming here for one hour. <laughs> well, thank you for coming here. Yes, yeah, it's um, a pleasure. I wonder if you've uh, seen or explored any uh, designs using thermal uh, mass, thermal uh, uh, ballasts. Go like, further. Like, like, uh, so for instance, uh, Middle Eastern bake ovens, outdoor bake ovens okay. alf also like often use uh, ceramics, uh, yeah. bricks, tile, that sort of thing, heat it up with a wood uh, heat and then shove all those coals to the side and the only yeah. thing really you're using the heat residual in the uh, thermal ballast. Right. Well, I do think that's part of the theory behind the, the grill. They um, Actually, when the grill was first being developed, they tried to put a thermal battery in there, which is just a phase change material. Are you familiar with these? So yeah. where the phase change happens at a temperature that's helpful for us. So we take some kind of wax material, you uh, melt it from a solid to a liquid, and then the theory was you could do that during the day, and then when you came home at night, you use that stored thermal mass, which then would be stored not only in the, in the temperature change, but also in the latent heat of the phase change to be able to re-radiate back out like a, like a um, yeah, there's a lot of phase change materials being used right now. And they just, I don't know that they could ever get it to work or get to a temperature that was useful enough that never panned out. So I'm not involved with the research, but I know I was really anxious to see that because I'm excited about phase change materials for a lot of our renewable energy. It gives us the option for thermal storage that's not electric. Um, and so it works beautifully on home heating systems and, and domestic water and whatever, but I just don't, you know, we're at a different temperature here. We need to get to 300s and 350, which is a lot more than what our domestic water demands. So at least not yet. We haven't gotten there, but. Um, it, it would seem that you'd need something with that Fren Fresnel lens to distribute yeah. the heat. I'll let you know. <laughs> I'm so, uh, yeah, I'm really anxious to see what, what we on that. And, and this, you know, it's a good question too with this reflector. This is one of my questions with this is my previous talk was about the thermodynamics of skillet material, right? So you're always balancing conductivity and emissivity and specific heat there. How good of a thermal storage is it? So I, the one time I've tried it, I tried it with a carbon steel pan that was pretty small, kind of mid-range as far as thermal mass goes. And I only got it to about 300. So I'd like to try both ends, try a cast iron skillet Right? Can we really hold on to the thermal energy better because the mass and specific heat make that a really, you know, s thermally sluggish material? Or should I have gone the other way and done anodized aluminum, right, where we have a much lighter material and it could respond much faster? And I don't know, but I'm anxious to try that kind of range. So, um, good question. So I want to suggest a challenge for you okay. is that you reach out to Iron Chef. Ah. And do a whole gourmet <laughs> dinner using this and see what the chefs can do. What can they really come up with in a creative food experience? I believe there was one episode. I don't remember what it was. I would like to have at that. But they, they did have one of the ghost sons. Unfortunately, they didn't educate the people on how to use them. And so this pop thing where they preheated the oven and then poured soup into it, which is like the number one thing you're not supposed to do. And it shattered. And then it seemed like this is a terrible technology. It's a beautiful technology you just have to know how to use it and so that was unfortunate so I would love to be able to do something like that you should write them and tell them what I should be oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, one last question what is do you think the most creative thing you've cooked or the biggest thing you've cooked mm. I mean I've just cooked for a lot of people at outreach events so there's this constant churning of cookie dough out of all these different things what's the most creative thing Barbara <laughs> my daughter's here hmm Sweet potato fries with a little sprinkle of feta cheese and Parmesan cheese and <laughs> parsley. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I'm not coming up with anything better than that, but sweet potato fries are great because if you get these things get hot enough or they get that nice, yeah. you know, caramelization, which is beautiful. It wouldn't happen in this. But What's that. the biggest thing you've ever cooked? I mean, I've cooked a loaf of bread. I haven't actually tried a chicken. That's something I've been wanting to try. I know you can do it, but pretty good sized loaf of bread. Okay. Bowl of pasta. Have you or any of your minions ever got body parts in the focal point <laughs> of one of these ovens and got So far, so good. <laughs> no, because this is really new for me. I mean, so the, this technology is all this year. Everything previous has been evacuated tubes, and there, nothing's dangerous enough concentration at that point. So, I mean, we're doing, you know, we are concentrating solar energy to replace coal in our traditional uh, power plants. 
And so it's different than PV. PV, based on the photoelectric effect, you go from radiation to electricity. We are instead using this kind of technology, this whole like acres and acres worth of mirrors that are focusing thermal energy onto the top of a tower, melting a molten salt, and then allowing that to create steam to run through a steam turbine in the same way that the nuclear power plants and coal-fired power plants are doing. We're just subbing out the fossil fuels and plugging in. We see that much more commonly in the west part of our country than the southeast. We have a lot of humidity in our atmosphere, and because of that, we get a lot of scattering of solar radiation before it hits the ground. So it's, it's, we like to think it's nice and parallel, but actually it's been thrown a bit because of the water molecules. To the western side of the country, the humidity is so much lower, you have much more consistency in the radiation, and so then the concentrations can be much more impressive. I forgot to hear us out. Have you ever made your own solar oven? Oh, no, I have. Okay, I have. I made one with my son once with the Pringles container. <laughs> so you take a Pringles container and you cut it and you kind of open. So it sort of was based on this, right, where I opened it up and then we put this piece of cellophane in and we tried to put a hot dog inside there. It didn't work. But it did melt. It was enough to make s'mores. So you can do that because it's reflective already on the inside of a Pringles container. So you just poke a hole in the lid and stick a skewer down there and put some marshmallows and then put a piece of shiny, uh, not shiny, but like, um, like overhead material, saran wrap, something on the top. So let the sun come in and then roast your marshmallow and pull it out and eat it. And send me a picture when you do it. <laughs> I'll give you my business card. I'll be so psyched. <laughs> I'll put it on my website. Did it taste good? It tasted <laughs> tasted so delicious absolutely you know that mushy marshmallow who doesn't love that that's good stuff hi nice in to the, see you back i think yeah. you're my chemist is that right <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm here every time in the uh reflector would you you would want the pan not to be you know, a point source on the bottom of it. Wouldn't you want it spread out over the Great area question. so that it wouldn't have one hot yes. spot and everything else? Would no, really cold? good question. And I, I, I know where you're coming from there. Um, actually, we were trying to figure that out. So, so this box came with this. <laughs> we did not know what this was for, but we knew it had something to do with, with focal. So what, really, what this is really is a mirror. So you can see what's happening to the bottom of the pan. So you don't have to go up underneath it and get in the focal point. So this goes down here. And I was experimenting with exactly what you're talking about. I don't want a point, especially if I'm on carbon steel or cast iron that's a relatively poor conductor. I want it like my range. I want it spread out. And we, so of course, we're a bunch of geeks. So we pulled this thing out and we put a piece of paper and tried to experiment if that was really at the right place. And it is. It's spread out. So you can almost see the shape of each of these mirrors on the bottom bottom of the pot, they try, it's not perfect, but yes, absolutely, it's not out of, so this we're getting, it's pretty much at a point, right, because that's all aluminum, it spreads out really quickly, but on that pan, yeah, it is really like these three zones of reflection from each of those parabolic things, so yeah, it's an excellent question. My concern was that it was, the focal point was too low, but, but we tested, I think it's right about where it needs to be, so good question for sure. Let's give Carla one more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, if we get a sunny day here in the Triangle anytime soon, <laughs> I hope you'll all get a hold of the solar oven and go test it out. Thanks, everybody, for coming out to the cafe. Hope you enjoyed tonight's program with Carla. This was n very few of our speakers bring props <laughs> at all. And then you bring all the props, and there's so I much cool stuff the to stage. see. Yeah. But it's so much cool stuff to see. Cool. This is exciting. So thanks, everybody, for coming out. Next Thursday night is science trivia. Bring your team. Come out. Compete for prizes. It's a whole lot of fun. We'll see you next time here at the Science Cafe. Oh, and don't forget... This Saturday is the Triangle SciTech Expo from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. all over the museum. You can meet local vendors, exhibitors, scientists from all the local universities uh, from all over the Research Triangle Park are going to be here doing demonstrations, experiments. There's going to be virtual reality, augmented reality. Every kind of cool science thing you can think of is going to be here in the museum for one day. So make sure you come out to the tri -Sci Tech Expo this Saturday. We'll see you next time. Good night, everybody.